Um, so Red is on his way. Let's start the meeting at uh, 6.31. Um, yeah, and before we dive in, I just want to, um, on behalf of the board, acknowledge um, everyone who acted so professionally and wonderfully with the, the scare we had um, last week. Uh, you know, obviously, it's fortunate no one was hurt. Um, and unfortunate that someone felt the need to uh, scare the whole community in, in that manner. Um, but yeah, with, with all these things, there's oftentimes a silver lining, and I think the silver lining was how well everyone was prepared, how well everyone acted, um, just how uh, uh, you know, adeptly and professionally uh, the response was, how quick it was. Uh, I especially want to thank uh, you know, uh, Chief Eric Nordenson of the Montpelier Police Department, uh, for orchestrating such a great team. Uh, all of the officers there, but in particular, officers um, Diane Matthews and Mike Philbrook, who were the first to respond, uh, rushed into what at the time could have been a very dangerous situation uh, you know, with, with nothing on their minds but securing the safety of our kids. Um, all of the you know, other uh, police officers who responded, including those from neighboring communities, my understanding is there are, there are officers from Barrie and and other communities who came to help, all the other first responders, uh, you know, the a helicopter was flown into Berlin uh, to be ready. Uh, you know, the other areas were secured to make sure that if there was a situation, we were prepared for it. Uh, to uh, Principal Jason uh, Gingold, uh, and of course to uh, Libby for uh, really orchestrating, um, you know, the the staff response on such a professional level for coordinating. Um, with the police, with the teachers, uh, with everyone, <coughs> all of the teachers, students, and staff. Uh, you know, the, the training uh, that they went through uh, was evident, uh, you know, and the way they held it so, uh, you know, adroitly and, and with, with a plum in a, a very, very stressful situation. Um, you know, and to the community. Uh, I think the community really communicated well um, and, uh, you know, information obviously was passed as quickly as it could, but. Uh, you know, people I think were, were very understanding of the strain and stress that everyone was under um, and, and everyone acted wonderfully. So uh, hopefully we never have to go through such a scare again, uh, but um, you know, thank you to everyone who, who made the situation um, uh, as, as good as, as really could be expected and, and, and better given, given uh, what happened. So um, I just wanted to acknowledge that on behalf of the board and, and again thank everyone in the community. Um, and now we can turn to public comment. Uh, and why, I don't know if anyone else on the board wants to add to that, but. Great. Yeah, I, I would just second the gratitude for the staff. My kiddo was here. I was in a building. I worked a couple doors down, so. Um, and I know that there was a very real sense of danger. And I've heard nothing but fantastic things about how the staff managed it and how you did, Jason. Um, and that the message and the support that was given to parents and how to talk to our kids about that was also really valuable and timely. Um, having folks who work with students this age know how to provide age appropriate direction about a combination of giving space but a sense of safety was really helpful and I, I really, I, I'm sorry I haven't reached out to say so but um, just thank you from the bottom of our hearts. <coughs> Yeah, no, again, uh, thank you. And also, uh, you know, the support of, of uh, you know, support for students and staff that, that were shaken by the event and needed, um, needed some, you know, some, to help work through it, uh, you know, and to reach out to Washington County and Mental Health and other support uh, was also uh, appreciated and needed and, and, uh, and, and uh, again, shows the, you know, the, the care and compassion that, that uh, everyone had. Um, so public comment, uh, I see a few people on the phone and in the audience. Start with the audience. Does anyone in the audience want to make a comment? I see one person. Uh, please come up to the front desk and, um, and introduce yourself uh, for both for the record and, and some people watching um, WR. Sure. Thank you very much um, for this evening. Uh, my name is Tim Sinnott. I have two boys who are in UES. Uh, Driscoll's in fourth grade, 
and Bailey's in second grade. Um, my partner, Hannah Reed, and I have long been huge supporters of public schools and of the teachers who dedicate so much of themselves to the education of our children. At the moment, uh, we are feeling frustrated by the lack of academic standards at UES, and we're particularly discouraged by the literacy data that is reflected in the experiences of our own two students. Despite their different learning styles, both of our sons have struggled to learn to read at UES, which has been challenging and stressful for our family. Um, we are now investing in a private tutor to help both of our children establish, for the first time, the strong foundational foundation in phonics, from which all reading skills stem. And recent conversations with a number of MRPS families have revealed that we are not alone in this struggle. Um, the information put forth in tonight's ABC data report um, is further confirmation. And I look forward to hearing how the board and administration uh, plan to address this critical gap in our school's academic platform. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, as you know, we're, this is on the agenda awesome. tonight. So. Fantastic. Great. Um, anyone else in the room? Otherwise, it looks like uh, we have uh, Amanda on screen, if anyone else is on screen. Um, yeah, please raise your hand. And my understanding is, and I've actually saw this happen today, is that Zoom has a new function that if you raise your hand physically, it will pick that up and actually put the raise hand function in the corner. If, you, if your yeah. camera is on, yes. Yes. <clears throat> uh, Amanda, and again, please introduce yourself um, for the record in the audience. Sure. Hi, uh, my name is Amanda Garces. I, um, that is for the record. And I am a parent of two uh, kids at UES. One is in first grade and one is in fourth grade. Today, I would like to thank every teacher, food service worker, instructional assistant, janitors, and every staff of this district for the dedication to our kids. Today is probably the last time, at least this year, that I will come to this board to beg you and Libby to engage with families to really see us as experts of our children and our community. We can do so much better together, but we get short change because of control and lack of empathy and the board's failure to engage with families meaningfully, creating an atmosphere of teachers versus caregivers. The school board data report does depict clearly the challenges that districts has. We are doing great for our kids like my daughter, but failing a high percentage of, our, of others. And I hope you as a board ask questions and understand that you do have a responsibility to this community. Data should not be seen as a hammer, but as a flashlight. I learned that in a training that I hope you take one day. A flashlight that is showing that you have been hearing from some of us that is not a myth. I'm not going to repeat some of the questions we have brought here before around the use of the STARS assessment data, around the flaws of the fountains and final, final assessments and the danger to only looking at some of those measures today. What I hope is that you engage with families and learn about what we're asking the district to do. At least have some heart to say that you're looking into the national conversation and are engaging with educators and families to meaningfully and accommodate and find a common ground about how we're going to change that disparity that we see in reading. I hope that this, that, that this data shows for you is that, that our kids have flaws but that we need to do a better system to serve them. That we use an asset-based system that is really looking at our kids with their strengths and the love that they have. I hope that we can talk about today um, that literacy is not a special education problem alone, but that students without disabilities are also struggling and we need to ask why. We have a special education system that fails teachers and students at the same time and a lack of transparency of how we're doing. We're blaming parents for an increase of special education evaluation requests and are not transparent about the amount of administrative complaints we are receiving. It is not enough to have a Black Lives Matter flag if we're not taking seriously our students' and families' concerns. We have a national conversation about literacy that points out how the assessments we use do not give us accurate insights 
but we choose to continue to fund those. My tone here is not an attack, but a call to action because this is a community that I, con I continue to choose to live in despite of it all. As I see parents in other school districts fighting against equity, I am amazed of the pushback that I received today. When I, not today, but always. When I ask questions about our most vulnerable students, I'm here today because I would love to make a call out to the whole community that we need to do better and that we need to speak up. Uh, this is why I will not come back again, um, but I hope that other parents really do come and share with you if you're not willing to engage with us. So for last, since it's my last login, I would love for you to consider really thinking about our BIPOC students and the support that they receive from the BIPOC Community Connections Coordinator who only gets funded like eight hours. Uh, she works four for the high school and some for the middle school. The students are really loving it. We, she's a black woman and while we're not funding her full-time position, it's, um, we should be asking that since we are trying to attract BIPOC um, educators. I hope that uh, we created a council district that is diverse funded and respected by the administrators and let's value our teachers and give them what they need. Um, so when now that you're negotiating their contracts and I hope that we value them as you value your administrators. And so I just wanna again, for you to remember the safety committee recommendations and really look at what we're feeling um, around the safety for our students. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amanda. Um, I do not see any other hands. Is that is that all? Again, thank you, everyone, for for weighing in. And after uh, consent agenda, we are going to have a, a more detailed discussion on on literacy and and performance in general. Um, uh, next is the consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I move to approve the consent agenda. Do I have a second? I second. Any discussion or questions? I had a question. Yes. Just, uh, the March 8th meeting uh, mentioned that we we're going to be discussing board priorities and indicators for success. So yes. are we going to be defining those indicators for success at that meeting? Do we, I was just wondering if there's a plan based on the last meeting. I think we're going to build off of what we did on the last meeting. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay. So I think we will definitely be discussing those indicators of whether they make sense and okay. now that we've had some time to, to sit with them. Okay. Great. Great. Any other questions or discussions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. And do you want to acknowledge that we now have A20 through A24 <laughs> effectively we did enacted? We did, we did it. it. I, I didn't know Go it was going to happen. but Go team. Yes. yes. No. Thanks to Emma and um, Emma, especially for all the great work on that. Uh, um, so, uh, turn it over to. I know, Olivia, you are far away, but but with us virtually. Um, so, uh, turn it over to Olivia and her team for winter data presentation. And I do before we start on this, just want to thank you. I remember when we started on the board a a data presentation of, of this um, depth and detail and uh, really information was something of our wildest dreams. So we, we really appreciate the, the work put into it and are very much looking forward to um, hearing the presentation and having a robust discussion around it. So. Thank, excuse me. Thank you, Jim. Um, I think in the room is Nick Connor, our community liaison, who I'm not sure has been to the board before. Um, so I'm sure Nick is waving at you and smiling. Mike Barry, our Director of Curriculum and Technology, Peggy Sue Van Onstren, who's our Director of Student Services, and Jess Murray actually had a death in her family, so she couldn't come tonight. So Mike, Jess, or Mike, Peggy Sue, and Nick will be pinch hitting for Jess Murray tonight. And if there is a question that we can't answer, then we will take it back to Jess and make sure we have an answer. But I bet we can answer most questions that have to do with Jess's work because we all work very closely together. And I will share my screen. Give me one second. <clears throat> Oops, that's not it. 
Hold on one second. And then I think Peggy Sue is up first. Peggy Sue, you ready to go? Yep. And the way we did this before Peggy Sue starts talking, um, the board got the the very the large packet of the ABC data. The presentation today is not a uh, not necessarily repetitive of that data, although there may be some similar data inside of it. Um, it's an addition to. Uh, thanks, Sue. I'll stop talking now. No, it's okay. There's some technical. There we go. Okay. Um, yeah, so like Libby said, what I, um, I only have a few slides here and then I have some other um, information that I can share based on questions we got a week ago. Um, we got a bunch of questions in the last 24 hours, so those are definitely not in the slide deck. Um, and some of them certainly we can try to answer, but there might be some that are going to require a little more time um, before we do that. But um, if you go to the next slide, Libby. Um, one of the questions that um, was brought to me was asking about our child count um, and what that trend looks like. So child count is a um, point in time, December 1st every year, we have to send to the Agency of Education the number of students on that date we have in the district that are eligible um, for an IEP. So um, <clears throat> I was able to look back for the last uh, six years. Um, and just show what that looks like. So you can see we had a high, we kind of went down a little, and we're kind of headed back up um, a bit. Um, although the, this is, I mean, there's not a great difference, right? The highest here was 150 in 2017, and it uh, looks like 2019 was the lowest at 124. So that was just one of the data points that folks were asking about, so I wanted to share that with you. Um, next one, Libby. There were some questions um, around what our initial special ed evaluations look like. Um, and so I was able to dig into some, um, there, there's not a place where this information is just sitting. So just to be clear, I went through file folders and that kind of stuff to try to get that information. So um, the light blue information here is the number of initial evaluations for special education eligibility um, that was done in the, those school years. The dark blue is out of that light blue number. Those are the number that were eligible. So when there's a gap there, the rest were not eligible for special education. Um, and then there was a question um, that was around, um, specifically around, whoops, uh, oh wait, I'm changing my screen, that's not changing, sorry. Specifically about um, referrals or the, the denial of um, special education evaluations. Those numbers are pretty low and not ones that I could share um, systematically, but what I could find, um, and again, it was a lot of digging to find this, was in the last two years, if you look at the orange, those are situations where there was a consideration of an evaluation, but one wasn't completed. Not necessarily because the district refused, sometimes it was the school wanted to do it and a parent refused. There were also times um, where parents um, reached out to the school and then through conversations and kind of understanding the different types of plans, so EST plans, Section 504 plans, IEPs that a team agreed that actually special education wasn't the thing that made sense for students, and so an evaluation wasn't done. Um, in most of those cases, it's because the student was performing near or on grade level or above, and so if you are proficient and performing at grade level by default, then you would not be eligible for special ed services because you don't need special, excuse me, specialized instruction. Um, so that's what that orange number is. Um, so hopefully that answered that question. Um, if we go down to the next one, Libby. There was a question um, around how do we know how students are doing on IEPs? And this is um, as, as a large number. And this is a really tricky thing that Mike and I actually have been trying to think about since we since I started um, and we haven't gotten a really great answer yet but I wanted to try to provide something to um, show you and so to start with the reason that we don't have a really great answer is because by 
virtue of what they are, they're individualized education plans, right? So there isn't a um, measurement that would be across every IEP for us to find. Um, IEPs are also written throughout the year. There's not like a date necessarily when all IEPs get reviewed. So there's not like a way to look and say like on January 10th, um, how many IEP goals were met or something like that. So um, what I asked one of the uh, assistants in my department to do, and she, it took her four days to do this, so I felt really bad. So this is not something, we're going to work on a, hopefully a better system, but what I asked her to do is look at the January objectives. So the way the IEP goals are written, they have quarterly objectives that lead up to an annual goal that we, is what the team is looking for the child to get to within a year. So I asked her to look at the January objectives for, um, she looked at 1,200 IEP goals and objectives um, for grades K through five and look at what the um, code was around the progress for them. So if you look at the bottom here where it says achieved sufficient progress, emerging progress, or not yet introduced, those are the codes within IEPs that talk about where an individual student is on each individual objective. So achieved, that obviously they've achieved it as it's written. Um, sufficient progress is they are making progress and it is likely that they will reach their annual goal. Emerging progress is that they are not quite where we want them to be, but they're still working towards the, progress, the goal um, and making progress. And then not yet introduced is, it hasn't been introduced yet. Generally, that's because the student is still working on a previous objective that um, there's been some reason that the special educator has felt like they couldn't move to that objective yet. So these are, uh, those, in those 1,200 um, objectives, the percentages of those different ratings. Um, it literally took her four days. I'm not sure that this really impacts or changes much about what we do because it doesn't, everything's so individualized, uh, but I did want to at least try to answer that in a way for now. So um, are there any questions about those? Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and then Libby, if you wanna go down one more. Um, so some of the things that I, and this is some uh, of the things that I've been trying to think about around our system. How are we making all our classes and experiences accessible for all students? Uh, how can we make the experiences for students and their families more consistent across the district? Um, one of the things that I have found is that there's often a difference not only between schools but also between case managers around practices and the experiences for families. Um, and I, it seems like what has happened in some cases is that difference then leads to mistrust because a family has experienced something and then they experience something different and so then it feels like someone's not doing their job the right way. Um, which isn't necessarily the case, it's just people have different practices. So really trying to look at what are the practices that we can align so that families have a clearer understanding of what to expect and don't feel like there's somebody not doing what they're supposed to do. Um, and then another thing that um, I've been thinking about a lot is how are we able to maximize our capacity to meet student and family needs while also supporting our special education faculty so we don't experience burnout. So um, we are currently down three special educators this year. So our special educators are stepping up and doing great work. Um, and there's a lot of intensity for some of them that I think is causing them unnecessary stress in an already really stressful job. And so part of what I am trying to think about is what are things I can do to help make sure that they are feeling supported, that they are um, you know, being recognized for the hard work that they're doing and that they don't decide to go somewhere else. Because quite frankly, there's a lot of special ed jobs opening throughout the state and we have really good special educators and I wanna keep them. So um, part of the work that I've been doing is really trying to look at our system, what are things we can do um, to look at caseloads, um, some of the way that um, things are right now where they're very much grade based um, as far as who case manages what really limits um, the ability to flex caseloads to make sure that people are feeling like they have um, a caseload that feels equitable with others and you know depending on the intensity of student needs or the amount of services um, 
they might not feel as equitable and they may be overwhelming. So the special educators have been great about kind of stepping up and supporting each other and taking on stuff to try to do that, um, but it would be nice to look at systems to support that. Um, other things not on the slide that people asked. Um, there was a question about the pre-K numbers and if our number this year is um, higher or significantly higher than uh, in other years. So I was able to quickly look at the child count numbers around that. Um, so in 2019, we had 14 students on IEPs in preschool. 2020, it was 15. 2021, the 17, and we're at 19 currently. So there is an upward trend. Many of those are speech related to articulation. So. Um, there are, are very different eligibility standards for um, children from 3 to 5 than 6 to 21. And so a lot of those um, that happen at that younger age don't necessarily translate into what will happen when they get into the school age. Um, and what was the other thing? Oh, um, there was a question about administrative complaints. That number, um, the only ones I know about are the ones that were either in place or have come forth this year, and that number is not that large. What I can say is that 50% of the ones that I have dealt with this year, there were no violations found, and then there were 50% that, re 50 that required corrective action, and in those cases, they were all procedural, so it was around deadlines and those kind of things. Um, we, st some of those, I got like literally my first week here. Um, and so there was a lot of training that we did in the fall with special educators, I did in the fall with special educators around some of those requirements to try to make sure that those compliance pieces were in place. And I think, yeah. What questions do people have? Questions for Peggy Sue? Sure, Pod. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, a lot of, so my questions stem from the fact that I'm very new to the world of special education. So yeah. it, it would be helpful for me to understand what we should be looking at system wide as metrics of success. Mm -hmm. Because it seems to me like maybe it's not necessarily children leaving their IEP plans behind because perhaps students will need an IEP, some IEP supports their entire academic career, but, there's, but that's what's helping them thrive. But maybe that's not the case. Maybe we do actually want to so, have them so not. The, I would say the ultimate goal of an IEP is to get a student to a place that they don't need one. So okay. if you require an IEP, that means that you need specialized instruction that's not available in our general system of support or that is so different from what is happening in your grade level curriculum that you need something specialized. So our goal is in special education to close that gap. So between, so here's where your grade level peers are and there's some skill that you have that we need to do something specialized to close that gap. So the goal would be close that gap and then it doesn't mean the student's disability goes away and there might still be accommodations they need to access uh -huh. their grade level curriculum and then we would be looking at a section 504 plan. Right. So that is all about accommodations to level that playing field and make sure that students can access their grade level curriculum. So that would be a metric that we would want to look at. The metric would be kids that if kids exited out exit. of special education. Okay, yeah. so that would be something for the <coughs> that that's a metric of success. Yes. What is what on a on the system on a system wide scale? What's something for the board to be paying attention to? Because I don't think we want necessarily our child counts to go down because that might mean that we're not bringing kids on to IEP. I don't know. Again, like I said, very new to this. Yeah, I think that it's, it is challenging to look at system success because um, they're so, by virtue of what they are, right, they're individual education plans. One of the things that I think would be great to look at as a system, which kind of melds a little into what Jess was going to cover, but mm -hmm. is that we are building the capacity that we're able to meet students' needs without them having to leave their public school. So I think that that, to me, is something that is um, really important. I know that's important for Jess. I know we've all been talking about that. Like, how do we build the capacity of our staff and our buildings and um, our programming so that, we, that our solution isn't that we need to find somewhere else for kids to go? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. We're not there yet. <laughs> yeah. But that is certainly, okay. uh, to me, that would be success, right? So um, being able to help close the gap for children between what their, where their skills are and where their grade level um, peers are, that's one. That's the one that we're trying to figure out how to measure on a system-wide way without requiring someone to spend four days going individually through goals, right? Right. Um, so we're still trying to figure out, you know, what are the things, um, and I think that the panor panorama, that was called, next year might offer us some different opportunities to look at data and try to figure that out. Um, because things like state testing, of course they're going to be below grade level because otherwise they wouldn't be on IEP. So there's no way, even if students are making growth, you're not going to necessarily see that when we look at a big scale picture of students with disabilities on state testing because, again, if they didn't have that gap, they wouldn't need an IEP. Right. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it's, it is something that we're still trying to figure out what is a, a way that we can do that. There are certainly um, systems that individual teams can do to look at um, uh, an individual's progress over time and look at the effectiveness of their IEP and that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, it's a good, we're still working on that. Okay. Yeah. I have one, one more yeah. question, yeah. which is that. Oh, on that. sure. Um, you, you mentioned building capacity. Yeah. And then one of the ways to, to know we are building capacity or for board to understand that is to make sure that kids are not leaving. Do we track that? How many kids are leaving because we couldn't provide them the IP? So, so they have to we have, so we have, um, yes. So Kay. we, yes, I could, yes, tell you the number. I don't have it off the top of my head. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. So, there, so IEP that. teams make a decision around what a, a child's programming needs to look like. And then if the school isn't able to provide that programming, then we have to look, um, you know, at um, what are, what are the, where are there programs that can do that. Mostly right now, I would say that the, well, almost entirely, I would say, right now, um, the children who are students who are um, placed out of district are um, around mental health, social, emotional, um, behavioral challenges, um, and that's certainly a trend across the state and probably across the country. Um, and the other thing is those programs have huge waiting lists. So even when we have kids that really need that because they have a high level of need, they can't, you know, they can't get there. So. Um, the more we can do to provide those supports within our schools, then we're not, they're not waiting. Can I, before I go to you, yeah. can I just quick follow up to that? Um, yeah. Because I mean, for students who might have, you know, very intense needs or very specialized needs mm -hmm. that require, you know, a place that might have like a much broader system than, than we could build out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how often is that and how often is, you know, is, and is, you know, are the I mean obviously we want every kid to have their needs met, but um, for certain kids, are those you know systems that we could like realistically provide, or is it the type of thing where you know they need to be in a more specialized program, and, and is the mm. you know solution mm -hmm. trying to make sure that access to those programs is easier because it's it's not something that the district could realistically there, build. There are certainly kids who need a higher level than we are going to be able to provide in public school for sure. Um, I think that. There's a middle that we could add, you know, that we could probably find. Not, yeah. So there's, so not to say that the, ooh, there aren't some students that are going to need more than we can provide it in public school for sure, um, for a number of reasons. But I think that there's a, there's got to be more between the the classroom and then, you know, yeah. So we just need to build our continuum more. Perfect. Yeah, that's all right. Oh, that's fine. <clears throat> um, what are um, the classroom teachers? How do they know what their role in this is? Mm -hmm. One of the things I think is really great about our special ed program is that kids are learning along with their peers mm -hmm. rather than in a different kind of process. Yep. Um, and it, that rests on some good collaboration, I would imagine, between the classroom teacher and the special educator yes. or team, the rest of the team. Yep. And so how do classroom teachers know what they need to be doing to help those kids bridge that gap? So in, for individual students, they all have case managers assigned to them that work with and meet with classroom teachers on a regular basis to look at what are the accommodations that a student has in a plan and look at 
what is like what are the lesson plans for this week or what's the unit for this week and then the special educator works with the classroom teacher to adapt that lesson and modify that lesson so it becomes accessible for all okay. students so there's a lot of collaboration there um, at the beginning of the school year, I did go around to all the staff meetings to doing just more like, here's your legal obligation as a classroom teacher kind of thing, like a one pager, like just to make sure that you all know that this isn't just something that you get to, you know, decide if you want to do or not kind of conversation. And people were great. I mean, it was, I don't think most people want to do, would do that, but I think it's just important to recognize that, you know, these are legal mandates that we have. So, um, the much of the classroom teacher support right now is coming from that special ed team that works with the teacher so um, that we have occupational therapists that might meet with classroom teachers to talk about how um, fine motor skills can be accommodated in the classroom and SLPs might be meeting with the teacher it really depends on what the um, individual students goals are and what they need for access but there it, it really is around cl a collaborative team okay thank you other questions? Kristen, Kristen and then Emma. Thank you so much for this report. It is quite robust and uh, it's really nice to be able to dig into. Uh, just for like some baseline foundation building, can you like just walk us through how an IEP referral works and then therefore how a student goes about accessing those services? Sure. So there are um, a few different ways that a referral for a special ed eval can occur. Um, in order for a student to be eligible for special education, you have to have a disability. There are three gates currently. They're changing in July because, you know, we don't want to keep anything consistent. So right now you have to have a disability. That's gate one. So there are a number of um, different disability categories in the Vermont special ed uh, rules that we teams have to look at to decide if a student has one of those disabilities. If they have a disability, the second part of that, the second gate is there has to be an adverse effect on educational performance because of that disability. So that disability needs to be causing them to have issues in some kind of education in a basic skill area. Mm -hmm. Currently the law says that they have to be in the 15th percentile, the lowest 15th percentile compared to their same grade peers in at least one basic skill area and you have to be able to show that with three different kinds of evidence. And so there are six types of evidence that a team can look at and you have to be able to find at least three of those that indicate that the student is in the lowest 15th percentile in one basic skill area. So if you have a disability that is adversely impacting educational performance, then a team has to look at the third gate is, is there a need for specialized instruction that is not available to all students within the regular programming of schooling? Mm -hmm. So if you have all three of those, then you are become eligible and then you would write an IEP. Referrals can happen a couple of ways. Parents can request um, re, um, an I, a special ed education evaluation. Um, a teacher could have a concern that there's a disability and request that. that. And then there's the educational support team process, um, which I might talk about later because it's changed this year and is, I think, a little different in every school. But basically, it's a team that's working with a student and they're not seeing the progress that they would expect based on the interventions that they're providing. And so therefore that team then recommends that an evaluation is done. The key is there has to be a suspicion of a disability. So it can't, a student not doing well doesn't necessarily translate to there's a disability. So we have to look at, um, make sure there aren't other factors in play that could be contributed to them not doing well, such as chronic absenteeism. Mm -hmm. um, so lack of uh, instruction, those kind of things. So as we're making a decision about whether or not um, an evaluation makes sense, we would be looking at are there factors that would be contributing that aren't disability related? And then are we seeing a student's performance be significantly below where their grade level peers are or where we would expect them to be? Mm -hmm. So Thank you. That was like an abbreviated master class. Thank you. <laughs> and just give a little kind of guidance conversation. We have a lot of data to get through on okay. a variety of topics. Um, and one thing I might recommend is I think we all want a deeper dive on this is maybe like a, a special ed 101 mm -hmm. as another presentation. Because yes. I know, I'm sure we have a lot of c questions about how it works, but if we try to keep questions kind of focused on, on the data we're seeing. Otherwise, uh, I think we could spend all night talking to Peggy Sue and find ourselves at, at nine. Um, Emma? Um, so yeah, one of the 
Thank you again. I'll just sort of like echo whatever, and, and thank you for working in special education. Thank you for working for us. Um, I would be interested to know like the actual number of complaints. Eventually, it doesn't have to happen tonight, and then how that those number of com administrative complaints have compared to previous years would be of interest. So I looked for the previous years, and I can't tell. I can't okay. find them. I I don't know how I would how find they were them. documented. Or, um, yeah, yeah. Um, I can tell you this year there have been five. Okay. That have all mostly stemmed from last year, but the, there have been five that I've dealt with since I got here. Um, and that sort of leads into my second question, which is that I know that there's you know a special educator shortage in the state of Vermont, and that probably extends nationwide. And we're sort of in this like um, almost a crisis mode in special education. And I'm just wondering, you know, one of the roles that we have as a board is to set policy and then ensure that the district follows the policy. And I was wondering if you could speak to um, your experience in what you and the district, uh, the areas of struggle when it comes to meeting and fulfilling the policy and the law. Because of the shortage? You're saying? I just am recognizing oh, that like, is why one is thing. Why is it such a hard mentioned. job? Is that what you're saying? No, <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering. Like, have you has anything bubbled to the Sorry. surface for you? Yeah. In this district, okay. that has highlighted um, a, a struggle for you and the district to follow our policies and the law. Has anything sort of risen to the surface? No. Um, I, so I think what I can say, generally, in, in thinking around the administrative complaints, um, specifically is that in those cases, it was always positive intention of the um, people that were working and it was never about the children or them not getting services. It was about trying to um, accommodate and collaborate with families. Um, and um, so there were times where a deadline got missed that got missed because in the name of collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, and so then it kind of came back to bite people. Um, so I would say that the um, case management part at times um, gets very intensive when there is a high expectation. And, I, and I, I'm trying to say this carefully because I think families absolutely have a right to have all the information about their students. So in no way am I saying that there shouldn't. And mm -hmm. case management should be the smallest part of what a special educator does. So if they have to spend much of their time doing paperwork and answering emails, that takes away from their opportunity to focus on the students. And there is um, a lot of email that <laughs> comes to all of us that really, um, I think, c can get better as people feel better and feel more trusting about what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think that what, so what I think, I don't think it's about policy. I think that if what I have experienced is it feels like there's a high level of distrust that then people are feeling like they need to constantly be making sure people are doing what they should be doing. And what I see is people doing what they should be doing. So I just need to help bridge that gap. I don't know if I said that well, but no, thank you. Okay. Um, there was one question I just wanted about the um, multilingual language learner numbers and why there were some students that didn't get services. And I just wanted to quickly acknowledge that because it was a question. So some students, there's a test you take annually and if you get a certain point then you no longer um, are eligible for those services. But once that happens there's usually a monitoring time where you continue to be monitored to make sure that without those services your um, performance doesn't drop. And there are also some families that just require translation for parents, but don't the students don't necessarily need those services. So that's why there's that discrepancy in that number. And I'll stop talking. Great. No, thank you. Thanks. Very, very <laughs> thank helpful. you very much. Good. Yeah, thank yeah. you. I really appreciate it. And and uh, um, me and I will work with you to try to bring you back for a, a deeper dive into into SPED because I know there's a lot of um, a lot there that, that I think we can okay. learn. Um, next. I don't know, Lizzie, if you want to direct it next, or? Oh, so this is just the stuff. <coughs> so I think that the information that she put in here is what was in the data report. Is that true, Mike, do you think? Yeah, this okay. is a summary of that. And I think what, um, first, I, I just share that Jess is doing an amazing job. Mm -hmm. It's unfortunate she couldn't be here tonight, because I think it would help showcase a lot of the hard work that 
mm -hmm. all of the SEL folks are putting in. Yeah. Um, she, what she provides here is kind of a summary of who's accessing, how many students are accessing um, SEL services in the different schools. And the services look quite different depending on developmental levels of the students and their needs. Um, and everything's individualized. One of the things that we're working on across our domains is how to track progress. Mm -hmm. um, and in SEL land, she's trying to figure out how do we track progress of those students so that they can come in and out of that support as needed and into uh, regular education situations or with the support that they need. Um, she's also working on hiring. There are, two, I think, two positions mm -hmm. uh, open right now that we're trying to fill. And um, we're honing in on some capacity building training for next year around collaborative problem solving which is a pretty big deal in the SEL world, and that'll be like a two-year commitment to that work. Um, so we're pretty excited about that, to build the capacity of our SEL staff to be able to work towards what Peggy Sue was talking about, um, being able to support students' needs in-house um, with more capacity. I think that's, that's what she would want to share with this slide. Mm -hmm. This, um, talking a little bit about hazing, harassment, and bullying investigations, these are just the general numbers. Um, what she has shared recently is that the, the pace of the investigations has lessened mm -hmm. as the year has gone on this year. Um, one of the things that I think also speaks to this is that we've gotten better at this work. Um, the state has gotten better at supporting us in this work and understanding what we need to do. Mm -hmm. So our investigations are happening and thorough and are hitting all the targets that they need to hit. This one I'm not too sure about. <laughs> Jess would do a much better job sharing what this one is. Um, but I think what this is is an average number of referrals per school day per month, um, I think. And what referrals means, a referrals are equivalent to incidents. So a referral could be um, a low level behavior and a high level behavior. So it's just a total number of incidents represented here. Uh, some data about suspensions. Um, she walks through the reasons for suspensions this year were physical aggression, substance abuse, um, abuse of swearing language, HHB violations, and threats. Uh, the trends she points out are that the number of suspensions each month has decreased over the year. There was a slight increase in January. Um, and that she's really pushing in and her folks are really pushing in with restorative practices from each of those events. And it looks a little bit different depending on the event and students and the needs, but that's been a primary focus for her and her crew. And that's Jess's piece. Um, unfortunately, we, well, um, for one, it's unfortunate just as a, a family, a family death. Um, it's also unfortunate she can't be here to answer questions. Um, any questions you think Mike could answer, but the, otherwise, um, I'm sure Jess will be back before us to, to do a deeper dive. Into, Just make a note. <laughs> yes. One data point that stood out to me. Yeah, go for permission it. to speak. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, was the HHB numbers and that in the 2022, 2023, this school year so far, and it's and it's up about half over. Mm -hmm is already above the other two years that were presented. And so I just would love to hear like sort of her take on, are we doing, you know, I'm, I'm guessing that number could potentially double, <laughs> you know, and, and what does that mean in terms of like, is it because she's here and she's implemented new processes or, you know, just would love to hear her speak to that. I can I can say what my assumptions are on that. And Mike, thanks. I couldn't find my unmute button fast enough. So thanks for doing Jess's slides. And right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the first um, right. Yeah. She's never used it before. So I um I would have an assumption, Emma, on a couple of different things. One, I think Jeff's Jess's position in and of itself helps because we're we have an administrative position who can focus solely on the SEL world. Um, and quite honestly, while it wasn't designed to be so in the beginning of the year, 
HHB was where she lived um, in Title IX. So the first the first half of the year has been a huge learning curve for Jess, but she's also gotten our systems in place for that. Um, I think a second thing is, is that we have new principals as well who have come in um, and particularly at MSMS, Julie Conrad is a middle school principal and has a really good understanding around HHB. Um, and so there's a, there's a different leadership there that's saying, no, we're going to start an investigation sooner. Um, I think another piece is that kids are still learning, right? That we're never going to eliminate HHB investigations um, because a lot of it has to do with learning how to be together. And as we've stated to the board many, many times, there is a significant loss of community and how we treat each other um, due to the pandemic. That is obvious. Um, and I think finally, um, we got a lot of feedback about that we weren't we weren't doing what we were supposed to do in this HHB world and investigations. And we take that feedback very serious, seriously. So there may be a reaction to um, what, what leaders perceived the community wanted was that they wanted to see more, more not suspension, sorry, more HHB investigations taking place. Um, so, and just because the investigation is there, those are the numbers of investigations. Those are not the numbers of substantiated or unsubstantiated claims or policy violations. So that's just something to keep in mind that that number, while maybe big, that's not a subs it's not a number that represents substantiated cases of policy violations. It's a number that represents the number of investigations. Peggy right. Sue, Mike, and Nick, is that a fair? Yep. Yep. And, and did I mean particularly maybe not so much last year, but a couple of years before? I mean, we've been in a COVID situation over the last few years where we've been kind of keeping kids apart and yeah, not mixing different groups as much. Do you think that has something to do with it too? And just in terms of keeping down the number of, of interactions between kids? One hundred percent. The kids kids two years ago were never independent. They were always with an adult. There was never any time when they were not with an adult, um, and there were never any time where they were they were together in that way. So you know, recess is definitely a place where HHB happen HHB claims happen more, right? So now we have we have kids who have more independence and freedom, and with that independence and freedom, they need to learn how to how to use that respectfully and in a way that we want all our kids um, treating each other, um, and that's a learning curve for kids. Absolutely. And Libby, I, I'm guessing that there may not be data prior to the three years that you presented of, you know, HHB investigation. We wouldn't have data of the amount of investigations that were conducted. The AOE has data. I'm not sure how far it goes back. Mike might know because he's my data whiz, but how far we have, we would have data on how many substantiated investigations we'd have because that's collected by the Agency of Education, but not the number of investigations that occurred. Does that make sense? Yes. Any other further questions for Mike? Brett? Yeah, please. No. Okay. Um, a couple slides ago, Jess did tease out that there's just some disproportionate data, like the percentage of kids that we have uh, that qualify for um, FRL, we're seeing like more behavior incidents for that particular group, or there were some specifics, um, you know, at UES, it was 15% qualified for an IEP, but 27% of the behavior incidents are attributable to that group. Um, so we saw a few different um, instances of that, and I'm just wondering how you all are thinking about that disproportionality or, you know, now that you have this data, you know, how are you handling it? You know, is it resulting in any changes in programming or um, staff professional development? But essentially that data now seems like it's in hand. What happens, what happens with it? So Mike alluded to, Peggy Sue might be able to speak to the students with special needs, but um, the Mike alluded to the fact that we are now partnering with the with Mass General around their Think Kids programming and is a collaborative problem solving um, that's based on the theory that if kids knew how to, they would. And mm -hmm. so we need to teach the skills that kids might be lacking. Um, so that is incredibly intensive training. I've done pieces of it before in a different district um, and involves coaching of our SEL teams and involves a whole lot of very intensive 
um, learning for our SEL teams that will start this summer. So we are we are reacting to um, how we work with kids when um, certain behavior skills may be lacking. You want me to talk about students with disabilities? Um, so I would need to look more specifically at this data to see, um, but my assumptions are that um, the students with disabilities that are represented here are likely students who part of their adverse effect and the impact of their disability is that they um, struggle with um, dysregulation, that they struggle with social skills, um, and the things that likely would cause a behavior referral. And so that's likely, whoop, most of those cases, um, something that's being addressed through their IEP as well. But that's just a guess without seeing specifically who the students are. And just to be clear, Peggy, so to add on to that, just because a child is on an IEP does not mean that they are immune to the, to the school board's policy. Correct. Around education. Correct. Questions? Um, Kristen, you had your hand up. Okay. Red had his hand up. Oh. Uh, okay. um, yeah. There's a little note in the behavioral incidents section. UES tracks majors only. Um, what constitutes a major behavioral incident? What are the levels of incidents? And maybe kind of examples. Um, and then what, what, why does one school only track that level of incident, maybe, um, sort of? Rhett, those are really good questions, and I want to make sure you have the right answer. So I'm going to hold that for Jess, if it's okay with you. Okay. And so now, of course, you know, okay, sorry. Sorry, Rhett. Back to me. Yes. Oh, um, I, I was good. I mean, other than just that disproportionality piece, I'm just thinking about like, you know, are, are you all thinking like, you know, what are best practices considered and how you sort of solve for those things? I mean, I would imagine this is the things that you all talk about when you have your team meetings, when you're seeing, you know, these, um, you know, these track demographics are showing up more on these behavior incidents and just how are you all working together and, and, and are there known best practices in how to solve for those uh, disproportionate pieces of, of data? And I think you, you know, got to that a little bit. Maybe it's something you're working on. Maybe it's something we're going to hear about in the future. But I think as this board is starting to identify these, um, you know, priorities and focus areas around, um, you know, the achievement gap and opportunity gap, I'm wondering how you all are, you know, plan to attend to those disproportionate pieces of data. Yeah, I, I'd save that for a longer answer from Jess. Great. <laughs> from a more detailed and longer answer from Jess, because she works very closely with all of our SEL slash resiliency teams. Yeah. Um, so she, she'd be the best person to answer that question. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm just had a um, question about trend. Um, in general about suspicion uh, uh, suspensions but specifically HHB do we I'm assuming you can't report on the exact numbers but but can you report on the general trend over the years do we do we collect that I mean it sounds like we may have access to that data right uh, over the years I have some data around that that I collected when the um, as when the safety committee was working particularly for the high school um, I don't believe that I collected that data around Main Street um, in particular. So I, I could give you some, but not all. And I, I can't give you, I'd have to look back. I haven't looked at that in a long time, Anna Kate, I'm sorry. But um, I couldn't, right off the top of my head, I couldn't say whether that data is tracked specifically to substantiated HHB violations or not. Okay. Maybe. And it sounds like we could request from the Agency of Education the substantiated claims, at least, however far back they go. That data, that data goes. We can we can get that data for you off of our power school system. With a caveat, uh, probably most reliable data within the last three years, but mm -hmm. beyond that, can't make any promises on that. And keep in mind that there are very 
very few suspensions in or uh, two two years ago. Right. Two school years ago and three school years ago. Right. Because of COVID. Yeah. Right. So it might not be it might not be very representative data, basically. Uh, right. Sage? From the last three years. Yeah, I just have one last thing for HHB. Um, I think this data is great. The metrics are great. It's you know it's wonderful to have these numbers to look at. Um, but more anecdotally, I think another perspective that would be good would be maybe our student reps, like Merrick and Zach, to survey the students and just say like you know how is how's the vibe? Like just get a, a pulse on the general feeling of the schools in general, of like is this making it? Is it is it? We're seeing progress in the numbers and the metrics, but it's actually making a difference in the schools. So. Yeah, I, I think that's totally, uh, would, would be really helpful. Um, maybe I can follow, follow up with you on that. Yeah. I Joe? think I'm in the minority. I just want to caution the board against, in the same vein that when you're getting all these emails, it's now a task that has been assigned to you. I'm just concerned that we're asking for a lot of additional homework that would take your time away from working with students. So I just want us to be really thoughtful and maybe things can get filtered through Libby and Jim as far as additional data or research. Um, I, I totally respect and understand that we need it to sort of help guide our policies, but I, I worry that we're asking a lot of additional follow-up and feedback and questions and for data that may or may not be useful. Um, and I don't want to be taking time away from the work you folks have to do. That's all. Good point. Um, other questions on Jess's presentation? Okay, thank you. I'd like, um, we move to the next one. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I get the opportunity to share a little bit about chronic absenteeism in our district. And, and first, I just want to start by framing it. And apologies if you've heard this from me over and over. I like to frame what chronic absenteeism is so that we have the context when we talk about the numbers. So chronic absenteeism is really including any time a young person is out of school. So whether that's excused, unexcused, uh, out of school suspension, those are all days that are being missed, right? That's lost instructional time because young people are not in the building. So when we talk about chronic absenteeism and what number of young people are chronically absent, we're talking about how much they're out of the building. Um, and, and so the definition of chronic absenteeism is missing 10% or more days of the school year. So in a full school year, that'll be about 18 days of missed school. That's the month of October as far as student days go. Uh, so it's essentially like missing an entire month of school is to be chronically absent by the end of the school year. Um, Libby, if you can go to the next slide. I wanted to uh, include some of this information as well because it, it really talks about a historical lens of being in school versus what we look at with chronic absenteeism. So when you think about attendance, uh, speaking for myself growing up, when I thought about attendance, I thought about truancy and I thought about uh, punitive measures and court and my mom will get in trouble and I will get in trouble. Um, that is still very much written into law uh, and truancy is still a, a practice that folks are used to and a lot of our families, when I reach out, they quick, are quick to go there. Like, what does this mean and, and what is this gonna come to? Um, the shift between really examining truancy versus chronic absenteeism is when you're looking at truancy, you're only looking at unexcused absences primarily. Um, so oftentimes that's reaching 20 days of missed school unexcused absences. Uh, you're really putting an emphasis on compliance, like you have to be here, these are the rules, this is the law. Um, and again, you're kind of lofting out there the legal system. A lot of letters that are written in our district previously uh, and, and in districts across the state and across the country will often reference state's attorney, DCF, it's the law when you get attendance letters. So looking at chronic absenteeism is, we're really trying to take a look at, at when are young people in our building and when they're not, we wanna notice that. So um, we, we're putting an emphasis on missed days and what it means to be present. If you're not here, you're not learning. Whatever the reason, and I'm here to, to support with the reasons, um, but ultimately you are not here and we wanna notice that. Um, we wanna take a, a preventative lens, which is why uh, you all have seen the data even last year when we talk about chronic absenteeism. We're watching it very closely because we can't just wait for 18 days to hit and then be like, okay, now we do something. And that's kind of a truancy model too. We're waiting for 10 days to hit, 
20 days to hit, and now we do something. We want to just keep watching. We want to reach out to families. We want to connect with families uh, and learn about why young people are, are not coming to school and how we can be providing different supports, be that case management, or even systemic changes that we may need to make. So I just want to frame up kind of why we talk about chronic, chronic absenteeism, why I put such a focus on that, and why we're not just looking at only unexcused absences. Any questions on, on just the framework there? Questions? Okay. No, this is for quick. Yeah. Um, Libby, if you go to the next slide. Uh, so this is our, our district right now. So this was as of January 20th, which was kind of the end of the semester for here at the high school. So we kind of used that as a, a point to pull some of the data. Um, this is our whole district. 32% of the young people in our district are chronically absent. So that essentially means 32% of young people, one, uh, you know, th they're missing at least nine days of school at this point. Again, this is excused, unexcused, but at this point in the year to be chronically absent is to miss nine days of school. So 32% of students have missed at least nine days of school. Um, that's going to represent 374 students. That's the size of our middle school. That's the size of our elementary school, right? So that's how many young people are chronically absent. It's the size of our, an, an entire school in our district. Um, I did isolate some of the data for um, young people who, who qualifies for free and reduced lunch. Their chronic absenteeism rate is 41%. Uh, students that have an IEP, their chronic absenteeism is 34%. And uh, our BIPOC students, their chronic absenteeism is 32%, which is right in line with what we see at the whole district. Um, the other piece that I included here was by grade. And you'll see this nationally where there's kind of like this uh, dip in the middle. And so in kindergarten, you see high rates of chronic absenteeism. And senior year of high school, <laughs> you see high rates of chronic absenteeism. Eric? Um, so I want to just draw your attention to this because this is something as we look at Trends in our district, uh, how is this lining up with what we see nationally? This can kind of represent more of a mental model than some of the systemic issues that are coming in in other places, right? Uh, a young person entering kindergarten, maybe it's the family's first time having a student in school, still getting used to what that means to be in school every single day when they have an appointment, when you have a family vacation. You're still kind of adjusting at that point. So we do tend to see more parents keeping students home when they're uh, in kindergarten. And then again, as you, you get to that 10th, 11th grade, absenteeism creeps up again. So this kind of uh, swoop, as you see it, is, is what we would expect to see in most schools across the country. You can go to the next slide, Libby. So here I just wanted to share kind of what our dashboards look like. So this is data that when we update this um, as best we can, weekly, bi-weekly, we're looking at what are the changes that we're noticing? How many young people? So we have a dashboard for every single school in our district. Uh, where we're able to see for that specific school, what are our chronic absenteeism rates. Um, so here at the high school, we've got 149 young people that are chronically absent. That's just over 37% of students here at the high school are chronically absent. I will say the way that attendance is tracked at a high school level is a little different than what we do at the middle school or elementary school. Where at the, the middle and elementary schools, we've got uh, daily attendance. You come, you're, you're March present, and you're there. At the high school, we're really tracking by period. So a student that may miss a certain block here or a certain block there, we're able to notice that at a more granular level. And so we are seeing a little bit more of a higher absenteeism rate, partially because of the system of attendance that you use in a by period system. So I do want to make a note of that. Um, so you will see some elevated numbers here. Uh, but that's just because if you're in the building once, it doesn't mean you're there for the full day. We're able to track it. Um, so again, here at the high school, we're at 37%. Um, as we move on through the slides, Libby, at uh, Main Street Middle School, which is where you see that lower dip, we're just over 27% of students who are chronically absent. If we go down to UES, we're at, uh, looks like 32% of students are chronically absent. Um, and we look at Roxbury, uh, we're looking at closer to 37-ish percent uh, of students are chronically absent. Um, so I just kind of wanted to draw our attention to kind of what's happening in each school. We do look at it and, and slice the data in different ways. Young people who qualify as free and reduced lunch, um, pieces like that. Um, Kristen, I, I think from an attendance perspective, to answer your question about, we see this data about a, a population of students that, okay, now we have the data, what do we do? Um, 
I will say from an attendance perspective, it's critical that we're centering lived experience and how we go about with decision making and informing and supporting families. That's kind of um, the luxury of my position is that I'm able to spend t more time with families and, and learn with them and identify what are some of the things that are, that are getting in the way, how can we be more supportive. So to me, that's about centering lived experience and how we approach that data um, so we can learn from our families uh, and students and, and try our best to respond to those pieces. Um, question. Sure. I mean, I don't know if you have that specific data, but I am curious what the chronic absenteeism would look like if purely sick days were removed. Yeah, so uh, I can say that we, here at the high school, it was about 50-50 ABE, so absent excused, versus ABU, absent unexcused. When we look at ABE, 90, 95% of the time, that's a, a student or family saying, I'm sick, uh, got a stomach ache, that's typically what an ABE would be. So if you look at just uh, absent excuse as sick, um, you're going to see it's about 50%. Okay. I mean, that's definitely pretty significant then. And I will add on to that and say um, many young people that I get to work with uh, may be um, coming up against some feelings of anxiety, not feeling connected, belonging, um, maybe feeling overwhelmed, that can manifest a lot of times as a stomach ache, right? And you tell your family that, like, oh, I'm sick. Um, a lot of times there's something more there that we want to be able to support with um, that isn't as straightforward as I tested positive for COVID. I am sick, you know? Um, so when a lot of families are calling in and saying, uh, my student's sick, that will happen, yes. And if that's 20 days in the course of a couple of months, I want to call them and be like, I'm noticing this and how can I be supportive? Do you have what you need? Um, because again, sick or, or not, lost instructional time is happening, right? And so that's really where we want to dial in. And just to follow up with that, I mean, how much of the absence unexcused are situations where a child just isn't showing up at school versus where their reason for not showing up at school might be known at school, might have been brought to school, but doesn't qualify as an excused day. It's like, for instance, um, you know, a family may be taking a trip and pull their, their child out early, yeah. and I know that doesn't qualify as an excused absence, but the kid doesn't have a choice, the family's going to wherever. Yes. Um, yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. yeah, and they're not just, you know, it's not like they're, you know, saying, but, you know, hi, Mom, I'm going to school, and they don't. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I think it's a mix, right? And it's a lot of times a lot of pressure is put on our front office folks to pick up the phone and make a judgment call of, like, is this excuse, is this not? So we're really trying to tighten that up this, this year and make, take the guesswork out as best we can. We did a lot of training for the registrars uh, in the summer to say, here's what excused is, here's what unexcused is. If you're in doubt, default to excused, because I'm not, we are not necessarily here to say it's unexcused and that will be punitive. We're here to notice absence overall. So a lot of times, yeah, a family will take a vacation. If you look at our absenteeism rates the week before winter break, they're high. If you look at it the week after winter break, they're high. Um, that's a reality, and I would encourage our students and families to really sit with, that's missed time, and when we can, can we schedule these things in line with school breaks? Can we schedule doctor's appointments when we're able to be outside of school time? Um, this lost instructional time, there's a whole lot of evidence behind chronic absenteeism that's showing it has an academic impact. If you're not here, you're not learning. It has a social emotional impact. If you're not here, you're not having that connectedness and belonging. Um, so there are lots of things that get in the way of young people coming to school. Some of it is family vacation. Some of it is anxiety. Some of it is um, families running on E and it's just really hard. Um, so all of those factors, we have to really look at everything. So from family vacations, which on the surface are very much like, I get it, it happens, and that has historically been looked at really different than a young person whose family is running on E and is getting unexcused in the same way. Well, that family was just on vacation, they weren't. 
And so we're trying to eliminate some of that bias, some of that uh, subjectiveness in, in how we're looking at the data, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Emma? Uh, amazing. I mean, just thank you. And I want to point out to anyone who doesn't already know, all of the listeners, all of our dozens of followers, <laughs> that this is a new position. Nick's position is new. It was something that we were able to get through ESSER funding, correct, originally. And now yes. it's in the budget. And correct. we're going to be moving forward with this amazing work. And I, I don't know how many other school districts in Vermont have a position like this. But, um, but it's pretty remarkable, the work that you're doing. Hmm. And, um, and thank you. Um, I'm kind of curious, kind of the same types of questions that Jim and, and Merrick are asking is, and you sort of touched on the lived experience and sort of more of the qualitative data that doesn't necessarily ping in numbers and graphs, but um, if you could give us a sense of like, I mean, 374 students would be your caseload, <laughs> but you know, not all of those students you're concerned about and you know, um, are really working closely with. Could you give us an idea of roughly what your what your day to day sort of uh, caseload of concern students student population is? Yeah, you know, I w we're concerned about all three seventy four. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and um, my intervention typically, um, so I do kind of the the front end tier one of like just noticing and and doing my best, and some days are better than other of. Just, uh, I, I don't like when families just get a cold letter. Uh, and so I do try to call home and make a connection point first. And then I'll say, also a letter's coming uh, and appreciate the context. Um, I would say at the tier three level, which is really where I'm, I'm digging in and, and doing that work, that number can ebb and flow throughout the year based on a student and families finding their, their stability to 30 to 50 students, I would say. Is this your second school year or is this, right? Yeah. Second school yes. year. Yes. Okay. And have you, do you have any sense of like if this is, were you able to get your feet under you that first year? Like do you get a sense of if this is sort of typical for comparison to last year? Yeah, I, I think so. It's, it's also really different um, in the way that young people are experiencing school, starting to build that connectedness back, and also their immune systems are not there yet. Right? And if you look at the elementary school attendance, you can see when there are giant flare-ups of uh, a virus being passed around right. and things like that. And so they're building immune systems back. And mm -hmm. so we're seeing increased absences in that way. It, it is kind of running pretty parallel to what we saw last year. Um, I will say we have some really uh, incredible young people that last year their engagement was really, really low, like really low. And when I see them in the hallways this year, it's just incredible. Um, I say that to say that for many young people, it takes time, right, to build that muscle back up of coming into school again. Um, and so it's running parallel and seeing the work of many of the SEL folks in our district and, and our resiliency team, and now with what Jess is doing, to be able to support a, a young person to come back into school with those kind of supports is, um, I think we're definitely seeing growth in ways that we didn't have last year. Um, so, so I would send that out to those teams for sure. Of That's huge. Right. I remember some kind of notification confirming an absence for my kids, but I can't remember what it's called or how to access it. Are there ways for families to access some of the data that you have about what their own, you know, I can't remember who yeah. was sick when, or, you know, totally. are there ways to access that information? There's a couple of ways. One is, uh, I believe, and Mike, you can help me out with this, but families can log into PowerSchool and be able to see the attendance data that way. Um, and another would be a call from me. Yeah. I will say the high school our school interface is a little <coughs> tricky because of the semester, so I haven't been able to like find where to go to see that number yeah. for my student who's in high school. I appreciate Just hearing that, and I think that that's maybe something that I could chip away at too, of, of 
making that like a bit more straightforward for families that just want to see that piece, click here, here, here kind of thing. Yeah. But, yeah, I appreciate hearing that. And how are you coordinating with, you know, some of the coaches and other people who run extra activities? Because just from my own experience, I mean, most of my kids lost time in high school is because they've got, you know, a track meet or a Nordic meet mm -hmm. an hour and a half away that starts at three. So, yeah. you know, the bus leaves at, at 1230 or one, um, you know, and that's that's great. It gets them there on time, but it also, you know, they're missing two or three classes. Mm -hmm. um, I talk to Nathan sometimes about his track meets, um, <laughs> but no, I mean, I think our, our registrars do a really great job. So in power school, when I'm looking at the data, yeah. there's always a note if they have it. And if it's saying something like Nordic ski or something like that, like I'm able to see that other people are able to see that and get a good understanding. Having said that, if that is piled on with X, Y, Z and we, and you know, like that's a factor. And then we can look at the academic data and notice if academic data is showing a risk factor there. We can dial in, and mm -hmm. there's a whole lot of value in being a part of extracurricular activities. Oh, definitely. Um, you know, and so uh, that's a part of being in school and, and having that experience. So it's really only going to come into play when that's piled on with other factors of, you know, Jim took another vacation. Uh, and so now they're out again. And what are we going to do about this? Because mm -hmm. it's starting to slip. Like, and again, we just try to notice and support and at, like start with that, like, how are you? As opposed to you just getting a cold letter of, you've missed this much time. Then you have to call and be like, here's why, there's this thing, don't worry about it. Um, so th that's a factor, but not a big one. Yeah. Kristen? Thanks. Um, I wanna echo Emma too, Nick. I just feel, I feel personally really moved by your work and the approach that you're taking to your work and it feels like we have this really reimagined truancy officer role, and um, I'm just really excited for your work to continue. Um, a quote that I hung on to from your section was, um, <clears throat> these economic barriers uh, make coming to school every day a challenge that the education system is not always tailored to support, which I know is so true, and I think we, uh, families are oftentimes doing their best, and yet there are just still these very significant uh, gaps, challenges, traumas in their life um, that really get in the way of getting kids to school. Um, and yet, <clears throat> the call of duty of schools are oftentimes already saturated, right? So I'm curious what, <clears throat> like in your work, if you're thinking about partnering with outside organizations or other partnerships to try to like attend to those, you know, those factors and variables and or in your conversations uh, around lived experience with student, with families, like are we connecting families to resources and how's that going and just what that looks like in your work? Yeah. Um, we are doing a, a lot of connecting local organizations who have been uh, amazing from Montpelier Housing Authority, uh, which has a long wait list of families trying to secure more stable housing um, to Washington County Mental Health, which is such a great partner. Um, that's a key aspect, right? So when we talk about just the foundational, if we're looking at Maslow, that those basic right. needs, right? Mm -hmm. um, the position that I'm in also allows flexibility for me to drive a family to a doctor's appointment who doesn't have a car mm -hmm. um, in ways that they would not have been able to get there potentially would not have gotten that prescription, which helps that student in school, which then we talk to the nurse and the nurse is talking to primary care and the nurse is able to say like, cool, we'll, we'll take care of it, we'll make sure they get there. Um, so I would say that's a, that's a huge aspect is really plugging families into these external resources um, and doing what we can to try to eliminate some of the barriers that would kind of build and build and build uh, and just continue to be overwhelming um, we're, we're not able to eliminate those, and I think there's work that we can be doing to support our students and families. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Great. Thank you. Uh, Libby, back to you. All right, so we've had lots, well, we've had a few families come to talk to the board about literacy. Um, and so I wanted to give the board a little background just on what makes up 
um, literacy instruction uh, and the importance of each piece. So this is coming, this is not a new slide, a new picture at all, or a new metaphor. Um, I believe it's been around since the 60s. Um, and it's a nice indicator of what goes into literacy and or learning how to read and just how complex learning how to read is. Um, and so, and we're going to get to literacy data too after this conversation, but we, we front loaded it with this piece first, and then Mike's going to take over. Um, so when we're looking at what skills go into learning how to read or skilled reading, this is one way to think about it as a rope. And each of these pieces of rope have an importance um, for some, and, and here's the kicker, not all kids are the same. Right. So kids aren't like a Ford truck coming off an assembly line. So some kids need the need a rope pulled on more than other kids. Um, so I can give you some good examples as a teacher who is taught in many different uh, places. Um, so I was a second grade teacher primarily for 10 years, around 10 years. And uh, I was in very rural Louisiana and I was in uh, inner city Brooklyn, um, and I've been in very wealthy Vienna, Austria, teaching second graders how to read with, with 13 different languages in my classroom. Um, and in each of those environments, kids needed me to pull on different ropes, parts of this rope. So in some environments, like in Brooklyn, there was limited vocabulary and background knowledge. And so I pulled majorly on those two strings of this rope in order to get my second graders um, who lived in um, what is commonly known as the projects in Brooklyn uh, to be skilled readers. We also did language structures. We also looked at verbal reasonings with inference and metaphor. We also looked at Prince concepts and we also, I also taught a whole lot of phonics and decoding and sight word recognition. Um, but I had to pull a lot on vocabulary. So I, we did a lot of walking trips, for instance, to the South Street Seaport and said, hey, look at those boats. Do you see the windows? Those are you, those are called portals. You know, we did lots of different kinds of things in that way. And it was all in literacy instruction. Um, but I knew that group of students needed to have that vocabulary rope pulled on more um, and the background knowledge pulled on more. Uh, in... Vienna, Austria, they had background knowledge, they had vocabulary, and my class, because it was so multilingual, may have needed more of the language structures um, in place. And so we may have pulled more on that piece for that group of students. And those are just groups of students. Then you have to look just to like Peggy Sue was talking about as individualized readers. Some individualized readers need more phonics instruction. Some in individual readers need more comprehension instructions because it appears that they can read any word. They're just not sure what that those words mean or how to string them in to understand the comprehension of, this, of the story. So there's many pieces that go into teaching a child to become a skilled reader. Phonics is most definitely one of them, and UES and Roxbury both focus on phonics. Um, you can't ignore the other pieces of the rope, however. So phonics can't be the only thing that we focus on in reading. We have to have all the pieces of rope, and we need to get better and more efficient at noticing when a child needs us to pull a little stronger on one of those strings. And that's the piece that we've been talking about so much with our MTSS model that Mike's going to talk about in a bit. The same idea is this, this model is from the 60s here. This is one of the latest ways. It says very similar things, except it adds some pieces into um, how skilled reading is, is, is created. And I actually like this piece better. So you'll see the same ideas from the reading rope. Um, that's what that's called, the reading rope in terms of word recognition and language comprehension, it shows where those pieces, of course, interact in a Venn diagram, but it also adds that green circle with the active self-regulation that includes motivation and engagement, executive functioning skills, and the bit like there's a metacognitive piece of strategy use, knowing when to use which strategy. Um, those, th those pieces are absolutely essential in, in learning how to become a skilled reader. Um, and there is no such thing in here that says in kindergarten, these aren't important. Or in first grade, um, the idea of 
I don't know, uh, inference and, and comprehending text through language is not important. All of them are important. Um, some students just need more of something than others. I have friends, what their, their one child um, seems to have come out of the room reading, and, but then and could read any word from the from when he was like three, four years old. Um, but then he said, what did you read? And he'd say, I don't know. He had no clue. So we'd have to pull more on that idea of comprehension and language comprehension okay. with him. His younger sister had had to really get targeted phonics instruction in order to read any kind of text um, from first grade on, second grade on. They were same same family, um, were read to in the same amount, um, but they were very different children. And so as a system, we need to look at be able to identify when a child needs a certain piece pulled on more than more than another. Um, however, having said that, all of these things are important in becoming a skilled reader, and we can't ignore one for the sake of another. Um, so this is just a just a background information of what becomes a skilled reading. Teaching a child how to read is incredibly complex. And putting up false binaries isn't helpful to, to teaching kids how to read because it is a very complicated process. And teachers will always need to be better and need to build their capacity at teaching kids how to read because it's so complex. Um, and so Mike's going to talk a little bit about what our plan is for that. Um, and I just wanted the board to see just the amount of things that go into becoming a skilled reader. And this starts from the first time a child sits on a parent's lap and has a book in front of them, one of the board books or whatever it is that, that you're reading with, with your child, right? So this all starts actually even before that. It starts when the child comes out of the womb and the parents start talking to them um, and that language piece and depending on how they talk to them. Um, are they talking in full sentences? Are, when they go when they go to when they look at a fish in, a, in an aquarium, are they saying, look at that fish? Do you see how his gills glitter and are moving in the water? That's how the fish reads or breathes. Or are they saying, yeah, it's an orange fish. That is a much different language piece um, that will eventually, if, pers if persistent, influence how a child becomes a skilled reader and when a child becomes a skilled reader. So there are so many complexities into a child becoming a skilled reader. And yes, we need to become absolute experts as teachers in how to do that. And yes, we have work to do in this area. Um, and I just want to make sure everybody can see that there are so many different ways that a child needs to, needs to there are so many different things a child needs to access in order to become a skilled reader. So um, I added this quote from Linda Darling Hammond, uh, rather than being subject to the pendulum swings of polarized teaching policies that rest on simplistic ideas of best practice, whole language versus phonics, for example, or inquiry learning versus direct instruction, teachers need to know how and when to use a range of practices to accomplish their goals with different students in different contexts. Um, and there's the, the reference for that. And there's also, the board will get this, this presentation um, it will also be on our website under the board materials. And if you click on the growing reference list, that's a that's just a list, list of references that um, I'm growing for the board and the community so that uh, they have more information about just what, what a child needs to become a skilled reader. Um, so that is there for, and some of them, I know you need like an access to some sort of university to get. So if anybody sees a title they want and then they can't access it, just let me know and I can get it for you. Oh, Mike, do you want to talk more about the, the literacy data? You don't have any slides on here, do you? No, wasn't I clever? <laughs> um, I think what, what I can do is I can answer questions about the report, but also talk a bit about our plan around literacy and what we're going to do. I've met with several community members, um, and I think I can say with all sincerity, this is the highest priority for us. Um, we need to improve our reading instruction and we need to improve in social studies, and we need to improve in math, and we need to improve in science. So this is just a part of our continuous process of improvement. Um, we have a pretty assertive plan going into the spring and into next year to support our educators and our students and our families in literacy instruction and learning. 
Um, one of the big things that's not as much of a wow factor for everybody, but it's like my geek zone. Um, we are really going to end this year identifying our prioritized standards, K through 12 and literacy, which is our roadmap of who does what. Um, and we don't have that. We don't have that established. Um, you know, and Libby and I have been here for five years. Three of those years were pretty spicy. Um, so in the two years that we've had to focus on this, I'm pretty proud of where our committees have come and our educators have come in doing this work. And by the end of this year, we will have identified prioritized standards in literacy, both in reading and writing, which is no small feat. Um, and it's very exciting. Um, in terms of focus at each different grade level, in K through four, pre-K through four, we really need to focus on those foundational skills that Libby was talking about and supporting our educators with a pretty robust professional learning model around what are the foundational skills, how do I identify the needs of students, and how do I move with agility in my planning and instruction to do that. Um, and that's not one of those things that you want to do where you have a consultant come in two or three times during the year. We want something very robust. So we're working on some models that could potentially do that and provide that for our educators in a way that's also considered of their wellness and focus and really uh, bite-sized chunks of learning so that it is sustainable. Um, we've seen that in many districts where they go too fast, too far, and it's hard for people to keep up. So we're, we're trying to really find a balanced, sustainable, and impactful method of professional learning. In five through 12, we're doing a lot of conversations around adolescent literacy both at the middle school and the high school. And it's been fascinating. We've reached out to school districts that are doing different models, where we've come up with a professional learning plan um, that helps with uh, content literacy, so literacy across the contents um, for next year, and really working with educators across all realms. Everybody's teaching reading and writing, in a sense. Um, and how do we do that well? Uh, it looks different for adolescent learners. Um, so how do we do that? We've, we've dug way into that. Um, and then a continued emphasis on our remediation systems, uh, K through 12. We have done some amazing tier three work this year. Our tier three interventionists have been spectacular and working very, very hard. Um, and we've learned a lot. And we've, we've found better ways to do things and we keep refining and we have this constant, almost weekly system of looking at our practices and saying what's working, what isn't, how do we do this? We're not waiting till the end of the year to look at everything and change it for next year. We're doing it as we go. Um, and next year, we, you know, we also have two open interventionist positions at the middle school. Um, so we're hoping to build that capacity of our intervention staff even further to be able to address the remediation needs of students. Um, and like Libby said, some students need this and some students need that. We want to make sure that we have staff members everywhere that can give this or that. Um, and make sure that they have that. So we are doing a huge amount of planning right now between now and the end of the year to uh, leave the end of the school year with everybody knowing what's happening next year and how we're gonna do it and support them in that work. So, um, thank you, that was super, super helpful. Uh, questions for Libby and or Mike? Joe. I think this is a question for Libby. I saw um, that you had testified, I can't remember which committee at the State House, about just mental health and the sort of additional layer and maybe strain isn't the right word, but um, that schools are really having to sort of become de facto mental health centers for our students and I'm sure our staff as well. And I, I can't help but think as I hear, you know, that it may not fit neatly into a box. It's probably impacting all of the pieces that you folks work with. I just didn't know if you wouldn't mind like sharing what you what you shared or what your recommendations are or what impact that's had um, in MRPS. Um. Well, it's it's certainly a different topic, um, but just briefly, oh, I was sorry. asked. No, you don't need to apologize. I was asked to to testify on the mental health needs. Um, I believe I sent those links to the board. Uh, Lynn Coda actually did a marvelous job in the beginning of that testimony, who's the superintendent of Franklin Northeast, um, who really detailed the influence. And, and Peggy Sue alluded to it earlier, of there, there just isn't the capacity with our mental health partners. Um, mm -hmm. They're overwhelmed, they're understaffed, they can't pay as well as some districts can pay. 
Um, and so they're losing people left and right. And they have incredibly complicated jobs with kids who have very um, intensive needs. And so they're, it's hard to train people to be skilled in that area. And it's hard to keep them um, once they're there because it's a high stress environment. So our mental health capacity or our mental health agencies need help and it needs to come from a statewide um, place. So so I I think that all, all the information, you know, Nick was, was talking about the levels of anxiety and all of that kind of thing that influ could influence chronic absenteeism. All of that, if a kid is not in school or if a kid is not accessing learning, it's going to influence pieces, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so all of this has a major impact on, on what we can do with kids because the bottom line, we, classroom teachers are not mental health experts. You know, principals are not mental health experts. Um, but we do know, know something about how kids learn. Um, and so we want, we want the state to help us help the mental health people and, and not think, oh, schools just need another grant to access to increase their mental health capacity, because that's not what we need. We need our mental health partners to be um, really robust and, and be able to collaborate with us in the way that they want to, but right now are being held back. So yeah, it, it certainly does influence it. And, and the board has seen that. We've when I started here, I believe I said in my testimony, we we had approximately a $750,000 budget for mental health professionals. It's now upwards to $2, two million. If you look at um, facilities upgrades because of spaces that needed to be, you know, if you add those pieces into it, that's a significant increase in five years. Um, and so we're building our own systems right now. And everybody, everybody else's as well. We're not alone in that. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Oh, okay. I'm looking here. We'll reach. <clears throat> Looks like Emma. Emma. Thanks, Jim, for the oh. tech support. <laughs> um, so one frustration that I've heard from caregivers is um, is that their access to their own students' um, assessments is limited, and I'm wondering um, if you can speak to like. Is is SBAC, uh, Star, Fountas, and Pinnell, are those assessments made available to caregivers, and do they have to request first? Is it something that um, is given without requesting? Can you just speak to that process of how the information is shared with caregivers. Mike, do you want to? Do you want sure. to take that? SBAC, we're given score reports for SBAC. The, the information parents get from SBAC comes from the state and they've changed that assessment now. So it will, I don't know how it will look, but Mike might be able to speak to that too. Yeah, I don't know how it'll look either, but um, the, the state's just rolling out the new Cognia assessment and has very limited information for a very short timeline. Um, there's, what they do say is that the results will be uh, quicker after the assessment SBAC, sometimes you have to wait a whole year before you get your students' results, so hopefully it'll be before the end of the school year. We don't know in what format that looks like or how it's done or anything yet. Um, as far as Renaissance Star, we do provide um, summary reports for families that request them. Um, we don't just send them home. There's a lot of reasons for that. Renaissance Star doesn't even recommend doing that. Um, Renaissance is a screener which is the 30,000 foot view of a student. It is not a diagnostic tool. Um, and it just is, is meant to be a screener and a benchmark system, but we readily provide that for families that ask for it. Um, F and P assessments are a little bit different. Those are something that we like families to really have a conversation with an educator about those results because it's not, it's, it's all edge speak. Um, there's not a good summary for families on that. So we do time those assessments for usually around uh, report cards or parent conference time so that there can be those access to those conversations. But anything a parent asks for, they can see. So is, the, is there another sort of um, <coughs> layer? I mean, so we're seeing these percentages are at or above benchmark, and that's based on STAR assessments. Mm -hmm. um, is there another like classroom level assessment that's being done you know, clearly there's the standards and they're sort of, yep. students are being graded on their, on those standards. Um, and those are available mm -hmm. to caregivers. Um, but I guess the feedback that I've been hearing is like sometimes uh, a child has struggles uh, in literacy or reading or whatever, and then the caregiver's not like aware of it. 
in time for them to feel that they're able to be responsive um, in a timely manner. Yeah, I, I'm not sure how much. So here's what I what I can say. We have a different developmental assessments. Like at kindergarten, there's there's a name assessment that is basically how how many letters do they know in their own name, mm -hmm. um, things like that that are all shared via the teachers. Um, I, I'm wondering if a lot of that has to do more with the timing of assessments and parent converse, conversations, parent conferences, report cards, things like that, mm -hmm. that we need to do a better job of. Um, one of the, the big names in education, Gusky, he talks about uh, report cards. He, he hates report cards. Um, he, he basically says schools need to stop talking about report cards. They need to start talking about reporting. Um, that there needs to be more access to what's going on with my kid in the moment and how do we do that and how do we do those things. We're trying to make that shift in many different ways. Um, and I think that that question might speak to that a little bit more than access to, to um, an assessment. Um, the, we have pretty clear assessment guidelines and if students are um, below at any point in those, that's what we're using to identify students for tier three. And as soon as a student is identified for tier three, the parents are informed of the data and the goals and the progress monitoring. And we've had really good feedback on that. Consistently good feedback, particularly in the K through four realm. Um, Mike, I would just add on though, that's a new practice. Yes, it's, yes it is. It's, that is a new focus for this year. We heard that feedback and we, we've, we've changed the process because of that feedback. Now, is everybody like so? When we're seeing this report at, at Union School in reading, uh, sixty-eight percent or at or above benchmark, are the rest who are not at or above benchmark are they tier three automatically or not necessarily? Not necessarily. They there may be students in tier two, which is uh, additional enrichment support or reteaching in the classroom. They may be you know they may. I don't have the cutoff numbers, but they may be one below or, or something like that. So it's not totally representative of that. Um, but the students that are um, significantly below are, are in tier three. They're receiving tier three supports, I can say that. Um, and we're progress monitoring those students and those parents are receiving regular communications in three week cycles. So there's a lot of communication going on. And, uh, and how long from the, I mean, I. If this is your first year, like really having the system in place, you may not know, but how long from the beginning of the school year until a caregiver could expect to be notified if their student was tier three? Seven days. So one week into the beginning of the school year. Yep. Um, I, I give the caveat of at UES and at Main Street, when Main Street will be, high, will be better functioning with a fully staffed intervention team and possibly at Roxbury. I'm not sure it would be that fast at MHS. No, MHS is, uh, that's a good point. MHS operates in a completely different system and we're, we're dealing with different challenges mm -hmm. have to do with what Nick was talking about with the master schedule mm -hmm. and credits and all sorts of different things. Can I ask a follow-up is, how often do you give the STAR assessments? Three times a year, fall, winter, and spring. I have another question, but it's not related, so I want to <laughs> give floor time to other people. Yeah. So right now in our district, about one in four kids, and in some cases more depending on grade level and things like that, aren't where they should be as far as reading goes. Is, is it realistic to say, set an expectation of, say, 100% of our kids can read at or above grade level by, say, third grade? Is that something that is a goal that we could set and feel like we could achieve? It's a tricky question. Um, third, the third grade benchmark is really important to us. That is uh, one of our big heading goals and conversations. I think what's tricky in this um, data is that, so even when you look from fall to winter, those aren't necessarily the same cohort. We have kids move in, kids move out, and they come in with different reading levels. And you know, an example of something we learned this year is that we weren't paying enough attention to students that move into the district. We were giving them a couple weeks to settle and didn't want to stress them out. 
and a high percentage of those students had some needs. They were, there was a tendency where they were moving from school to school to school and missing some key foundational literacy skills. And so we changed our practices this year and we screen those students as soon as they come in and it's been transformational for our efforts to support those students. So I think that you know, you, you're not talking about a consistent set of kids that would be here for those three years every year. And I don't, I'm not offering that as an excuse, but I think it's a, just an element of context to have. Um, it would be our goal. That's what we would want to have happen. That's what we would work towards. I don't know that we would achieve 100%. And then the slides that Libby showed with the rope and the Venn diagram make sense to me. And it is pretty eye-opening for me because as a non-educator myself, it did not, I don't, did not understand the complexity of what it takes to, to teach a kid to read. So I really appreciate that little mini, what'd you call that? 10 minute masterclass? Abbreviated masterclass. Thank you. Um, because that is true that kids need a mix of phonics and comprehension and different kids need different things how are teachers able to know day to day whether or not what they're doing is working to reach every child in their classroom yeah that's what we need to work on that's that okay. foundational professional learning that we need to do and we've had a lot of turnover in the last couple of years so we have new teachers we have veteran teachers we have teachers that have transferred schools um, so we need some continuity on our foundational l literacy understandings and that's why we're putting this big push on something that's going to be very comprehensive and usable by the teachers. <coughs> Not focused on a program, but focused on those foundational knowledge skills that they need to be able to make decisions in the moment about what a student needs and do that well and fluidly. So we're looking for kind of a next level model of how to do that and we're looking right now and we have constraints we have no substitutes you know so it's hard to pull a grade level team out for a day to do a training we have to think about it differently and how we're going to do that and we also have to value the educators wellness in that process and not completely burn them out you know we want to make sure that this is sustainable and makes change in our classrooms for our kids and just to follow up on that i know it's totally about to get it but how good do you feel about the assessment tools you have to figure out? Because there's, I mean, there's two steps. There's one that, you yep. know, child X is appearing to struggle to read. And then there's, so, I mean, and that can be kind of hard to identify yep. in and of itself in a class of, you know, 17, 18, you know, depending on how much, you know, the, the teacher is, is noticing, how much, you know, a, a caregiver is, is speaking up and saying, I'm noticing this at home. Um, and then you know picking that out and then secondly like assessing kind of why mm -hmm. the child is struggling to read I, I, do you feel that how do you feel about the adequacy of the tools we have to make that identification just one that there's a problem and two what what the root of the problem is because if you don't understand the problem it's hard to solve it yeah so i can't speak to cognia yet yeah. um but that that'll be interesting to see what what information we get from that um, Ren Star, I feel pretty good about. Um, I know that there's kind of a mix of feelings out there, but when you talk to any district about their screener, that's kind of the response that you get. Um, really, the value in a screener is how you use it. And I know that a lot of districts in Vermont use Renaissance Star and use it well. The schools that we talked to about adolescent literacy that had really striking programs that were making an impact on students in 5 through 12 all used Renaissance Star. So I feel, I feel pretty confident in Renaissance Star as a good tool for us at a screener level. Below that, at the diagnostic level, we're getting much, much better at looking at it. And kind of our mantra is we don't want to give an assessment that we're not going to use to do something. Um, so we constantly review our local assessment plan, and we're reviewing our local assessment plan this year. So we're considering F and P. There's a lot out there right now about F&P. However, when you dig deeper, a lot of those schools had other issues going on with their implementation. It doesn't really speak to F&P as much as it does their impl implementation. Um, so we want to be considerate of that. Our, our teachers have expressed that they could get information out of F&P. We want to understand what that means. So we're looking at it. We're saying, is this a value? It, one of the things about F&P is it takes a long time to give. So we have, to, we have to really think about what we're getting in return for the time that we're, we're putting into it. So we are doing that kind of evaluation. Um, and then I think this year we've hired some staff that have brought some new tools to us in terms of even deeper diagnostics. 
that really help us understand what students need around syllable structures, word knowledge, vocabulary access, all these things in a really much more refined way. And our tier three interventionists are sharing that and spreading that. So we're starting to, we just had our vertical team meeting on Monday where all the interventionists from across the district are together. And we give time for those folks to share those practices between each other and really start to spread the wealth. Um, and I think we're doing a much better job of that. So each year we'll review that and we'll go with what's gonna give us the best information about learners, regardless of you know, what's popular or what we have or whatever it is. But I, I feel pretty good that we're in the right direction on that. And Mike, I wanna add on to, to the other place that we know our teachers need capacity building in is everyday formative assessment. So one of the pieces, you know, local assessment plan is local assessment plan. It comes around three times a year. Um, it's to give, you know, these, these checks, uh, programmatic checks, and we certainly use it for individual kids, but that's not enough to identify needs as fast as we need to identify them or want to identify them so that we can give kids the supports they need. That needs to be coming from a, a expert teacher, expert informative assessment, knowing exactly what they're looking for and how to ask about it. Um, and that needs to come with, regardless of what you're thinking of, if you're thinking of the foundational skill that they're teaching or the comprehension skill that they're th teaching, whatever it is, um, we need our teachers incredibly skilled to be able to do those very quick checks and take action on it that day or the next day. And that's that's probably where our biggest need is right now um, in, in building capacity for our teachers. That, that sounds like an answer, an answer to one of the question I was asking about how teachers know day to day whether or not they are um, what they're doing is reaching each kid and you're saying you don't have it yet. Yeah, like I was having conversations with teachers just this year out at Roxbury to say, do you need permit? Like I give you permission on Friday to be your assessment day. You know, like if you haven't, if you haven't sat with a kid on what their focus is for a, a week, sit with the kid on Friday, just do it during your reading block time. Like I, they were like, we can do that. I said, yeah, because you're teaching the next week is going to be so much better. You know, it's going to be so much targeted and individualized for what kids need by having very up-to-date assessment information. And I think our, our teachers aren't there yet in their thinking. Um, and, and so, you know, we bring in this local assessment plan and school, it's a mandate for schools, right? We, we have to these three times a year. Um, and I think Sometimes teachers take that as, and that's my assessment, right? Which is not accurate. Formative assessment happens every single day. Um, and how are we, how are we writing that down? How are we formalizing that so we have a track of what we've taught kids and what they need? How how are we acts or how are we taking action on it immediately instead of waiting for second for two, tier two instruction? Those are some questions that we I think we have, and um, it will come. It, it's, it will come as we keep going, but that's a major part of the capacity building and directly tied to our um, MTSS model that we're building. And like Mike said, that kind of work and that kind of level of skill and expertise does not happen because we bring one person in to talk about one of the reading skills. Like that just doesn't, right. it's, it's a, it takes time um, and could, because it's so complex. I have other questions, but we can well, please. go ahead, Brett. Sure. Mm -hmm. So this is a lot of data and the amount of data is growing pretty dramatically. Um, and we have families and community members that want more access to more data, more transparency, one could say, um, with respect to their, their kiddos. Um, we also have open interventionist positions that we can't fill. Would it be in the interest of the district to consider additional administrative positions to help dive into the data and provide it to our teachers and or families? I mean, are there people with those skills? I'm thinking of Jill's comment and I'd rather see our educators educate and our interventionists intervene than spend a lot of time trying to communicate with families who deserve information, but maybe that's a little bit beyond what we should be asking of, of our educators. I mean, is that something that 
is worth considering? I would say that's their job. That's an educator's job to communicate with families what's happening. Um, I don't, Mike, Mike will say, yes, we need a data manager. <laughs> I know that that's what he's thinking right now. Um, and perhaps we will down the line as we continue to be more facile. We just discovered that Nick Connor is a is a uh, spreadsheet wizard, which we'll, we're going to use now that we know his super secret ninja skill with that. Um, and teachers need to not only take quick data, but act on quick data and report out on quick data. Like that's, that's so assessment and reading assessment and and figuring out what to do next, that is teaching. That's not separate from teaching. That is teaching. So um, so I would say that's that's the work of a, of a teacher. And, and it may be a paradigm shift for some of our more um, veteran teachers. I think I can speak to, and I won't say what Libby thinks I'm going to say. Um, just to give some context, some geeky context on what it takes for us to put this together right now. Um, it's it's essentially by hand right now. So it, it does take a significant amount of work and time away from actually doing the work to address the data. And so I appreciate that question. Um, but just so everybody knows right now, this is Nick and I drawing up spreadsheets with VLOOKUP codes and doing a lot of things that, that aren't designed um, to give us this data. Um, right now, and but we have plans that are shifting towards a more sustainable and more automatic structure and system that I think is going to be transformational. So right now, one of the analogies I used with um, the interventionists recently is was we need to stop patching up the boat that we're in right now because the new boat's almost here. And we just need to get to that new boat. So we have a, a program called Panorama that at, uh, if and when the, the budget passes, we will be transitioning to that has an MTSS dashboard that houses absenteeism, um, IEP intervention plans and progress monitoring, and uh, social emotional data all in one space. Um, now, every vendor tells you that any their product will do everything that you want, so I'm, I'm not saying that, but it's going to be a heck of a lot better than the two of us geeking out for three hours doing Google Data Studio. Um, so I think we're moving there. I think we're moving to a place where we're going to have more robust capacity with this data, and it won't be as difficult for us to put together a report like this for y'all because we're going to have systems that, that make sense. So we're almost there. Um, so just like all of you, I just really want to thank Mike. I think, um, you know, not everybody knows that when you were hired on basically within a, a year or so, you had to like completely pivot and be very flexible. And I think you more than almost anyone in the district, maybe you and Libby have had to wear like a million different hats. You were the principal, assistant principal, principal. of interim principal yes. for the middle school for a while. Yeah, I mean, so it's it's incredible how much you've been pulled away from your job and it's a real relief to, to have you here tonight presenting on what your actual role is meant in, and intended to be. And so I'm looking forward to the type of progress that you're going to be able to make now that you're in your specified role. So it's really appreciated that you've been able to be so flexible through COVID and all of that. And, and then I'm really excited about you being able to do the work that you were hired to do. Um, I'm wondering about the SBAC data. Why is it still embargoed? When, what, what are we able to see now from that data? It's still embargoed. Um, it's still embargoed because the state is waiting to give us our snapshot, mm -hmm. which I presented last year and is, is not really usable. So it's, it's embargoed because of that. That's all I know. I can tell you, or Emma, you will, you will probably know at the exact same time we know because it will be a press release and a press conference that we weren't aware of. <laughs> you, pro you probably know before we did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't understand either. And the fact that it, they're sunsetting the assessment and holding on to those results is even more confusing. I don't, I don't know. We've asked a lot. Um, and then back to Kristen's question about sort of now that you have the data and you're able to like 
um, see who is sort of disproportionately impacted and this and that. Um, I know that, I mean, we don't necessarily have that information in the presentation, but we know that free and reduced lunch um, kids tend to underperform um, with meeting standards and assessments like this. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, like, what if there's like a district wide plan to, or maybe um, just a grade level plan <laughs> um, to sort of approach that disparity? Yeah, there, there's a lot in that question. So, one, free and reduced designation right now is really spongy. Um, it, is, it is not clear. Nick is a part of a, a state level conversation about a different measurement than free and reduced lunch because it's impacting states and funding and the superintendents are talking about this as well. So FRL in itself is really funny. Um, and I heard a great quote from a, a speaker the other day who was a free and reduced lunch student. And he said, FRL tells you more about how I eat than how I learn. So we need to think about that data differently. I really appreciated that point of view. Um, having said that, I think all of us are in our own initiatives are working to help with those students. So there's a lot of crossover between my work and Nick's work, for example. So when the interventionists are working with a student um, that's going through homelessness, or I know that Nick is transporting, there's this connection point about the work that Nick's doing and what the interventionists are doing. Um, we had some students transition into the school that Nick was a part of that transition and the interventionists went out of their way to welcome that student and like go an extra mile to make sure that that transition went well. So I think there are a lot of immeasurable things that we're doing right now that maybe we weren't doing as well or as consistently as we should have been in the past. But now that we're all looking at all these different factors, there's a lot of crossover supports in that area. I think what the interventionists are looking for are trends in terms of skills. So one of the things, so a student in a tier three intervention may have three different skill-based goals, and we're tracking all of that. And that skill is progress monitored three times during the cycle. And so what we're starting to, to see, are there students coming from particular demographics or particular grade levels or whatnot with the same lagging skills? so that we can see, is that a tier one instructional concern? Are they not getting it in the classroom? Is this something from the prior year? Are these kids that were moving in, which is something that we, we took away this year? So I think that we're much more um, cognizant of all of those factors and putting it into immediate action and trial. So one of the things when we discovered that the new students weren't, we weren't paying enough attention to them, we did a pilot for two weeks and, as it turned out, like the next day we had five students move in. And so we're like, great, let's seize this opportunity. Let's, let's, let's try screening these students and see what we see. And then by the, because we meet weekly, we're able to have these conversations on a very regular basis about what we saw. We saw that those students all needed significant uh, literacy support in between UES and Main Street. So we were able to put things in place much quicker. And then we, we talked about that and what did we see and what was a consistent lagging skill. So I think that what, what I want to convey is that we have a practice in place that is allowing us to consistently consider those things and react to them quickly and test them out and then react again, where I don't think we had that before. And I just want to do a quick commentary. I don't want to turn the conversation away. We, we are at 8.40. We do a few items on the agenda. Um, and we're also cognizant that Peggy, Sue, Nick, and Mike, and Libby are um, are being kept from other other parts of their lives. So, um, so definitely a few more questions, but let's try not to go into the wee hours. Um, Kristen, one last burning question. Um, so it sounds like there is a lot of like thoughtful thinking and analyzing and planning happening behind the scenes. I mean, it would be great for you guys to wear like head cams every day so we could actually see. I mean, it's just so much. And I'm no, sure you, really, you really don't. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> um, and, and there's still kind of loose ends and things are still coming together and it sounds like these things have already been underway and they're also and they're also probably responsive to some of what we're hearing um, 
so I'm wondering if there will be a time that all of this can get into one place in a digestible format for our families and community members to know and see and feel rest assured that there is very concrete, uh, you know, actionable things happening in the district, whether that's the, the podcast or, you know, the podcast, for example, where it's just a, a, that kind of a format that feels really digestible for folks. So, you know, I feel like this happens a fair amount where we get feedback from the community and then we get the reveal at these meetings that all these great things happening. So I'm just wondering how you all have a plan to kind of roll this out for the community. Chris, and that's the whole purpose of the um, Four Pillars blog that yep. our principals, our principals publish um, monthly or bi-weekly. A little fuzzy. I woke up at three thirty this morning, so I'm a little fuzzy as to whether it's it's two weeks or by month. But each one of those publish, each one of those um, blog posts will be about one of our four pillars and the work that's happening in that school. Um, and so, so that's one of our efforts to do that. Now, whether that is getting to the people who need to hear it or it's the right, you know, I was in a communication seminar today and whether that's the right strategy or not, that was our attempt to make our work here more public because it, I feel like I've said the word complicated and complex 10,000 times tonight, but it, it is truly like building this system is, is truly very complicated work. And it's a lot of edgy speak, as Mike said earlier. Um, and so that's one of our ways for doing that. Um, and I think our principals have done a really nice job at, at writing those up. Um, so if, if uh, that's one of the strategies that we've used this year. I would agree. And I read them. Every Thank time. you. <laughs> yes, so it I'm is sure not Jason's work. smiling right now in the audience. <laughs> it's not work done in vain for me. And I understand the conversation at the last board meeting is, you know, trying to not put things on you again, but what is on us as board members to kind of be in the megaphone to get that information out there. But I was specific, specifically speaking to this literary piece because it is, it, it's, it's become, it's been bubbling up, right? So, so just, and there's incredible work happening yeah. so just how that gets to one place in a digestible format for folks there's a couple things that we're doing so one thing that you have to know is that when we come talk to you in generalities we have to talk to our educators before we go here's the plan to the public mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and talking to our educators they have very limited time mm -hmm. so for example in this next month I'm going to be meeting with each grade level at, at each school to go through this plan garner feedback from our educators get some good ideas on what they're thinking and seeing. And that's gonna take, it's gonna take me a month to do that. Um, but it, it's the right thing to do, right? And then um, the other thing that we're working on is a, it, I feel like, and Libby will laugh as a former curriculum director, I feel like my whole life has been built on creating a parent curriculum site. And I never quite get there. It's a very difficult thing to, to make time to do. But we are planning to have a parent curriculum site that will have access to the priority standards, the proficiency Fabulous. scales, all those things by the end of the year as we do those, knowing that curriculum is always in draft form. Mm -hmm. So it's always changing, it's always in the process, and some things will be there and some things won't. But we'll hopefully have that up by, by June at the latest, but sooner than that, hopefully, um, with all that information as well. And that will not be, I've had conversations with three different parents in the last week wondering specific like what should my kid know by the end of the year yeah. so I think that will be greatly appreciated yep. yeah thank you it's always on my to-do list okay, thank yeah you. I think I mean I think it's worth noting that a public a public public schools and a public school decides is one of the few institutions that does this much interface with the public that does not have a communications director because mm. people consume information mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. so many different levels I mean, it's really like a full-time job to translate this and, and put it out there for, sure. for people to digest and know. Mm -hmm. so, and yeah, I do have to say, Jen, that Anna does a marvelous job. I was going to say, don't yeah. overlook Anna. I mean, uh, but, but, that's not, but that's not her job. But it's it's, it's like part of her job. 95% of her job, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, the, the, the amount of communication she's doing is fantastic, but um, not having one person to centralize and be like, well, we can get this blog here, but here's how we get it here, and it's, it's mm -hmm. tough. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just had a follow up for that because I agree with Kristen that there is an awful lot that of good happening behind the scenes. And 
a lot of it, it I can also understand the frustration of parents who are who might be listening and hearing okay I'm hearing Mike say that this is going to be in place next year but I have a kid who's having a hard time reading right now and one of the main themes that is arising from the public comment that we've been hearing for me anyway is that these parents really want to be in partnership with their students teachers and with their with this district in 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 getting their kids to succeed and one of the themes that we've heard from Libby and Mike and all of these educators here tonight and in other board meetings is that they also really want kids to succeed and so I'm wondering about what is that and it's okay if you don't have an answer right now but what's that missing piece that is hindering that collaboration is it more information is it asking the right questions is it not knowing you know not, I, I don't have the answer, and I, but I feel like that's a pretty big missing piece for us right now for, to, to support the collaboration between parents and their kids' educators. I think that's a really good question for our principals, Mia. Okay. Um, uh, it might be something that's worthwhile for the principals to come present on the board. So for instance, this year, Julie and Katie, so MSMS and UES respectfully, or respectively, um, both read through every report card that went home, every comment, everything. That's never happened before. Our educators were a bit taken aback by it. And, and some report cards were sent back to teachers to say, no, you need to make a more specific comment about this kiddo and what's happening. Um, and so it's, it's lifting that standard, that expectation a little bit. So that's just like one piece of evidence of like, I'd love to hear um, it's a good question, I think, for our principals who are closest to the relationship between teacher and parent. Any further questions? Well, I want to thank all of you for putting this together. This is a, a ton of data. It's yes, super helpful. Thank you very it really much. helps us get a fuller picture, and I think it's also raised some ideas for some you know deeper dives. Obviously. I think one of our goals, as always, is to make sure that we're improving our understanding of how our kids are being educated and what's working and what's not, and where we need to make investments, um, and where we need to build on successes that are that are already happening. And you know, we we can't make that assessment without these type of presentations. So um, I know it's a lot of work, but it's time very well spent, and it really helps us know. It helps us communicate with the community. Uh, it helps the community know. So. Um, Thank you, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing, thanks. Yes. Uh, I think we can go through the rest relatively quickly. Um, we don't have five policies to in draft reading anymore. <laughs> Just so, one. <laughs> um, so we have a policy monitoring report for D15, uh, which is our HIPAA uh, compliance. Um, do have a motion to approve D15? Hopefully we do not need 10 minutes on this, but if we need 10 so minutes, moved. Second. so moved. Second? Seconded. Any discussion on the HIPAA compliance policy? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And um, the second reading of the D22 library materials, there was some uh, edits made in relation to the feedback that was given uh, last meeting. Um, any comments or discussion about that uh, that can be incorporated by the policy committee uh, before a third reading? My plan will be to, um, after tonight at our next meeting, will be to accept the changes that as you see them in this document. So if there's a change that you don't like or you have questions about, I think that's where we should focus our time. But I'm not going to go through tonight in the interest of time and make all those changes in okay, real time perfect. to do that in the policy committee. And this is something you can, between now and the next meeting, you could also forward a comment to Emma or the policy committee. Yep. And that can be made and for viewing. And you know, as we just witnessed with the other policies, yep. we can have as many readings as we need. <laughs> we can have six yeah. every time. <laughs> I will email you. The only thing I saw is in the cross-reference policy section, they seem to reference policies that are VSBA model policy, like the numbers of the VSBA and not ours. Um, like C29 is the district equity policy, whereas ours is F22, unless they're supposed to be referencing the VSBA. Yeah, this is actually something that um, 
Anna and I are going to work on just okay. renumbering our policies I to see. match oh, the okay. VSBA policies, yep. but I'll, I will make note of that. Okay. Thank you. Yep. but just to say out loud for the sake of a, being in a public meeting. Um, one thing that stood out to me is there's language that's like building diverse and inclusive collections is a core value. And I might just be like an obnoxious wordsmither here, but I don't think that the building of the collections is the core value, but it's one of the ways we live our core values of equity and inclusion. So I would just offer that as a suggested edit. But like I said, I can email you that language if that is helpful. Can you just bring my eye to the exact mm, paragraph? Yes. Sorry. Um, I can in just a sec. The third paragraph. There we go. They can. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Okay. And then I still have a question of how we know if we are accomplishing what we intend to do with this policy. Maybe that lives in procedure, but it does also kind of feel useful to name it in the policy. Just mm -hmm. things that will tell us. What are the indicators of success, I guess, would be the way to think about it? Yeah, we did reach out to Sue with that question. Okay. And she did respond, and then I just haven't um, okay. been able to circle back with her yet. Great. So I'm hoping that she has some helpful guidance for us on that piece. Great, thank you. I'm excited to have this policy on the books. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, and thanks again to the librarians for uh, bringing it to us and, yeah. and advocating for it. Um, other questions about D22? Great. Now uh, we go to executive session, which I think can be relatively quick. Um, we're going to executive for two sessions. One is uh, contract negotiations, um, and the second is personnel evaluation. Uh, can we have, first we need a, a motion to, on the finding uh, regarding contract negotiations and Anna has very helpfully put that in here. And my feeling, Libby, is why don't you come in <coughs> to executive session for the first part and then we can let you go for the second? All right. Um, I got this. Yeah. I move to find that premature general public knowledge regarding contract negotiations would clearly place the board at a substantial disadvantage if discussed in public. I second that. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Um, second motion. I move to enter its good session for the purpose of discussing contract negotiations and also the second part uh, with the personnel. In person. Yeah. Excellent. Um, second. I'll second that. Those in favor? Aye. Great. Um, before we get up, can I just say, this is Anakin's last meeting. Oh, today. is it? Right. And, um, oh. Okay. Where's the cake? Oh, the cake's <laughs> in executive session. Just kidding. Anyway, I just want to reach out and thank, thank Anakin for his three years of service to the board, and it's you've been a great colleague to work with. Yes, no, thank, thank you for you noticing. Anakin. I thought we, I had in my mind we had a. Uh, you thought we had one more? I thought we had one more, um, but we don't. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, thank you, Anna. Uh, no, we will, we will miss your very thoughtful voice uh, and advocacy on the board, and we also miss your um, wizardry at numbers and um, negotiations and financial skills as well, too. Thank you. I'll miss uh, your carpooling out to Roxbury. Uh, you're a good carpool yeah. buddy. I, I enjoyed working with all of you, and I'm going to miss... Yes. Yes. And I learned a lot from each of you and 